Good evening. Tonight on Chat Room, we're talking to Māori Party co-leader Marama Fox. Marama, thanks for coming in. It's great to be here. Let's introduce you first. You haven't been in politics very long, so people need to get to know you. You're, you hail from the electorate? Um, I come from Wairarapa. I have um, whānau links to the Wairarapa, but I also have whānau links to Gisborne, to Ngāti Puro, um, to Te Araroa and Hicks Bay. So um, right across the board, I think. It's fair right, to say. Right through the very long electorate. That's right. <laughs> 780 kilometres of yes, long electorate. Yeah. How many times have you been up and down? Many, <laughs> many, many, many. Up and down and up and down. In fact, um, I've spoken to Simon Bridges about the uh, roads north of Gisborne. And um, I'm going to bring this up because everybody knows that you get a cone like this, that you put around um, slips in the road, yes. um, around damage uh, north of Gisborne. They have, um, you know, the white things on the side of the road with the little sparkly Reflector, reflectors yep. on it. They're orange. Why? Because we're not going to get to your little slip anytime soon. So oh. we put a semi-permanent one that is orange around your roadworks. Right. Serious. And you've, you've had several looks I've at had, them by the sound of it. I've had several looks at them and I've said to Simon, Simon, have you, even, have you seen one of these? I guess you wouldn't have because where you come from, your roads get fixed. And what do you say? He said, let's go for a road trip. So oh, okay. we're picking up Ming and we're going to do a ride up the East Coast roads and I will show him where all these places are. Now Hekia Parata tells me that one of those slips in the road where the whole road has collapsed down like this um, has been there for 21 years and she knows that. Good because Lord. she was pregnant at the time. Good Her daughter's Lord. now 21. Well, let's watch the space and see if you can get some... Right. Yeah, yeah. Are right. you a spokesperson for roads for the Monopoly? Um, <laughs> you will find that I'm spokesperson for everything, <laughs> yeah. considering we have uh, two people. So, yeah, you're both yes. spokesman for spokespeople for everything? Well, Tudoro is a minister now. Yes. So he has um, the Whānau Water Ministry and he also has the um, Māori Development, which has changed from Māori Affairs, and he is a portfolio of economic development. So everything else falls to you? Pretty much. <laughs> Just as Pretty well, you're much. multi-talented. That's right. Yeah. That's what happens when you have nine children. Yeah, I was going to say, well, let, let's, let's do a little bit of background. You trained as a teacher? Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, I started off in Kōhangareo. I was 18, um, married with a mortgage and a baby, and went to Kōhangareo with my child and learnt te reo Māori there, started working there, did that for five babies, seven years, um, and then moved into Kurakaupapa Māori, right. followed my son into Kurakaupapa, and um, as an unqualified teacher, and eventually I thought, time to get qualified, really, even though I was doing the work of a teacher, and in Kurakaupapa you're allowed to because there is uh, a lack of teachers with the real Māori competence. So um, off I went to get qualified. Enjoyed it? Loved it. Yeah. So um, there came a time where I thought, what am I going to do? And I spread out across the floor of my lounge a prospectus from every art school, university and teacher's college in the country because I thought, I don't have to be a teacher. I could do anything I want. And I always wanted to go to art school, but that never happened. Too many children. Anyway, yes. so... <laughs> I Teaching picked, probably pays better. That's right. Well, I, picked, I started reading them and I found the course that I really wanted to do and it was in Christchurch at um, the Christchurch College of Education with John Gooley. And he designed a course for teachers who wanted to teach in lower decile schools. Oh, in particular? In particular. Okay. It was fantastic. Absolutely blew my mind right open. The things he talked about, he did as part of a teaching course, counselling psychology. Um, he did as part of a teaching course, the how-to um, around uh, behavioural management, rather than, uh, he says, I don't want you to write me 3,000 words of theory about how to. I want to know that you can do it. Right. So he would put us under immense pressure and we weren't allowed to smile, weren't allowed to lose it, weren't allowed to swear. And um, he said, you'll come under a lot of pressure and we need to know you can handle it. Right. Loved Is that sort of it. course still around? No. Okay. It's not. Should be. Yeah. yeah. Should be. So, so you went to Christchurch for your training. How long was that? Um, I did. I had by then. I had a Tohu Mata Ranga Māori, which is a, an equivalent to um, Bachelor's of Māori Studies, I guess. Um, and so I did the one-year graduate diploma of teaching. I was going to say because did you have to move the whole family down? To I Christchurch? did. Yeah. How I, many children at that stage? I had five children at the stage, and I was pregnant with my number six child. 
and um, so she was six days old when I went back to teach college. I had her in the holidays, came back, she was six days old. Yeah. Just Let's carried on. Mystery. How many children have you got? Uh, so I have nine. Yeah. Yes. How old are they now? Uh, my oldest is 26 and my youngest is three. Okay. And I've worked with all of them yes. until um, we finally got paid parental leave with number seven baby. Um, and I tried to get back pay. But they were having none no, of that. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I did try. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what a revelation to have time at home with your ch with your babies. So it's a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. To have the choice. I mean, I worked because I had to. I couldn't afford not to work. Sure. Um, and so my husband is a sharer and um, has been sharing his whole life, apart from a little stint in the freezing works. Um, and we met in the sharing sheds. Um, I, we all went to share with our uncles for um, summer holidays. That's how we made our money for school and yeah. books and all those sorts of things. Um, so I had to work and I liked working, so I just took babies with me to work. Yeah, sure. um, but it was teaching, it was kohanga girl, so and it was yeah, it facilitated perfect kind of exactly work to be in it, different exactly. than a sharing shed. That's right. Yeah, no, yeah. wouldn't have been taking baby <laughs> to the sheds. sheds. No. But to have with those last two or three babies to be able to stay home for the six weeks absolutely. must be magic. Absolutely. So mm. um, we debated in the house the other night about the um, extension to the paid parental leave. Sumeroni is trying to get it extended from eighteen weeks to twenty six. Absolutely support that. We were able to through our influence with the government. Um, Māori Party was able to get it extended extended to 18 weeks. Mm. Um, we'd like to get it to 26 weeks, but I think there is actually a, a period of time where the 18 weeks needs to bed in. The country needs sure. to get used to paying for that. Yes, because it's a whole different Absolutely. way of approaching it for us, isn't it? And the other thing we were able to do is get the extension to those who qualify. So um, people on part-time work, people on seasonal work didn't qualify for paid parental leave um, as the people who are on full-term work. So um, that was also included with the 18 weeks. So it's a greater range of people, it's a greater um, outgoing expense for the country. And so if we can bed that in for a little while, I would have no doubt that we will eventually push that out to 26 weeks, but I think actually at the moment it's a bit too soon. soon. So like we you say, we need to get used to it. Need to get even part of a generation on so that it's right. not queried all and the employers, time. And employers need to get used to it. I don't think we need to wait a generation oh, on. I don't know, but yeah. But we, certainly new probably babies. one election on. <laughs> yeah, okay. We'll give them three years to get used yeah, to it. Yeah, that's enough. And <laughs> yeah, then we, I think we should bang it in <laughs> yeah, just yeah, yeah. about 2017. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> then you, you, you went from a teacher, you moved into sort of management policy roles? Um, I came back into um, the Kura Kaupapa. I taught in secondary school um, education for a little while and I came back into Kura Kaupapa as a principal um, and uh, helped establish our Whare unit which is secondary schooling of um, Māori medium education. Uh, and then yes, I had another child, had another two. Um, Are we having more? <laughs> no, um, I'm done. Just You're quietly. done. My body tells me it's over, that's yeah. enough. So um, I did have another two and so I took some part-time work in local colleges around Wairarapa while I had those babies and eventually I thought actually, um, a circle of influence. In the, in the high school, I sort of couldn't be a teacher anymore. I got to a point where I thought if I'm not the principal, then all I end up doing is arguing with the principal <laughs> about um, how we treat Māori students, um, about Māori student engagement, about all of those sorts of things. Um, so I thought I could take up the good fight here for my one class or my 10 students or my whatever, yeah, sure. or I could um, grow that circle of influence over uh, policy yes, and direction. Yes, so hence the policy and So hence I went into yeah. the Ministry of Education for a little while okay. and, um, and then stood. I was going to say, after the break, we'll talk to Marama about her move into politics. Welcome back. We're with Marama Fox. Marama, politics. Why now? Why politics? Um, I've, I've always been interested in politics. I went to school in Christchurch when we grew up. My mother um, got a job down there in the Department of Education. Uh, the Minister of Education at the time, had, she'd established a play centre in Waitangirua. He came to have a look at it. This was in the very early 70s and thought it was amazing, thought she was doing amazing stuff with whānau, um, little parenting courses, and sent us all to Christchurch. So I grew up in Christchurch, the only Māori kid in my class. Um, my two sisters, the only other Māori in the school of 600. Goodness. Um, yes. And then an intermediate, only Māori student apart from one other school of 600. At high school, um, there were about nine Māori students in the school of 600. Did you feel that back then? 
Um, I started to feel it over that time. Had fantastic, fantastic teachers. Loved my education. Um, I remember coming home one time and going, Mum, I'm not black. And she would say, who called you black? I was a little girl in, in, at yeah, softball sure. who I was beating her just quietly. Yeah, you've um, got to say something, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, and yeah. so um, I didn't understand yeah, though why I got... <laughs> I didn't understand why I got called yeah, black because sure. I said, I'm not black, I'm brown, and I didn't get it. Mm. Um, and I was about eight, and that was the only thing I remember at that stage. I remember being asked by my friends in class, were your, were your grandparents cannibals? Did they eat each other? Yeah. Um, why don't you which speak Maori? Yeah, I was going to say, which yeah. reflects our appalling... Um, History, history classes in right, school. Right. Yeah. But to their credit, my teachers defended me, which was fantastic. They said, well, you don't speak Māori. You go to the same school as her. Why don't you speak Māori? And, we, and I used to start to think about that. Why don't I speak Māori? And when I got to high school, you know, the year starts every year with Waitangi Day. And in the 80s, when I was at high school, um, this was just before the Treaty of Waitangi was brought into legislation, right? protests out the window every beginning of the year yes. and so all my friends would look at me and go why aren't you marry people just be happy with what you've got what is that about and I'm sitting there the only Māori student going defending the whole, the of, Māori whole of Māori dumb, dumb. going yeah um, I don't know <laughs> and then we'd go into class and we'd study it and I thought I just why don't I know more stuff. why don't we know more it's kind of interesting actually because of those kids if there'd been dozens and dozens and dozens of you and those kids hadn't asked those questions, you may not be here today. I may not be here. Yeah. I mean, I start in Kohangaroa and when we go to open our buildings, we get KKK sprayed across the doors. Someone put a hose through, a, a, through one this? of the slat windows. This was in Carterton. Recently? And, oh, no, this was years ago. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, started. not recently, surely. No, well, they put a hose through the window, flooded the whole place out. Yeah. But we moved our kura into um, Masterton. It moved from the country into the town. And everybody... Um, wrote letters and submissions saying we don't want you here and this is going to happen and it's a it was separatist a tense time, wasn't it? I guess it was. Because um, we went from, you and I would have been at school at about the same time, went from perhaps some inquisitiveness, which is what you went through, yeah. to now where I'm hoping you to tell me we're more sensitive than we were in the 80s. It's, it was sort of the 80s, 90s where things got really, really tough. Yeah, things got very tough, but I think, um, you know, Hence the political road. I've yes, always sure. been a political animal. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've always sort of stood up for the underdog, always sort of um, said, this is not right. No. Where is the equity here? I never felt prejudice against me in Christchurch growing up in shops or anything like that. No. I moved to Masterton as an 18-year-old and all of a sudden I'm not being served. I'm being followed around the store. I'm, and I just didn't understand I'd walk into, you walk into a store in a city, people are on you straight away. Yeah, sure. They want your money. Yeah. I walked into a store in, in small town Masterton and people would ignore me, just flat out ignore me. And this still happens. Like just, you know, in the middle 2000s, I walked in and asked about a brooch. I wanted to buy my mother a brooch for Christmas and I'd seen one in Pasco's or something like that. And so I came to the local jeweler and I said, look, I'm looking for a certain brooch. I've seen it in the city. They laughed at me. They said I should go down to the shop down the road where they have that sort of glittery stuff. And, and oh. I'm like, excuse me? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and so this is, so it still happens. Still happens. I, my mother gets followed around the store. She's 70 years old. Mm. You know, so, I mean, there is still how stuff we, like that. How, how do you fix that? Oh, I've got plenty of Good. ideas. Let's go. <laughs> now? Yeah. Right. Go. So um, I think that we need to make Te Reo Māori compulsory in schools. Right. I for think all children? For all children. I think it needs to be um, a core subject. Why? Because with Te Reo Māori comes tikanga Māori. The culture. Comes history. Yes. About Māori language and about Māori. And all of a sudden you get a generation of children who will grow up with that and understand. Um, and, understand. Yeah, sure. and all we're asking for is understanding. Yeah. It's like nobody knows. Yeah. And in my maiden speech, I talked about a piece of legislation called the Native Schools Act. Yeah. Um, in 1867, they debated in the House of, of Parliament whether to exterminate the natives or to educate them, uh, to civilise them through education. But if they were to educate them, they needed to do so through a language that was more conducive to human thought. 
Right. It's frightening now, isn't it? Isn't it? But yeah. what, but that piece of legislation stayed in place for a hundred years. Yeah. Because it's still debated, even amongst Māori, whether they were allowed to speak Māori at school or not. It seems to have depended on which part of the country you were in. Well, the thing is, legislation outlawed it yes. by law. Yeah, yeah. Whether or not some people allowed it, it was ad hoc and maybe a teacher would let that happen occasionally. Yeah. But um, across but, the country, look at our language, yeah. decimated. But with that, our confidence, our culture. Now, I call that cultural genocide because for 100 years, you've been told that your language is not good enough. Sorry, no language here. Your culture is not good enough. Sorry, you need to come and do what we're doing. If you want to succeed in this world, you need to come and do what we're doing. So your culture is not good enough. Your language is not good enough. And actually, they also passed the law that you were only allowed to learn cooking, cleaning, nurse mating and labouring by law in this country. Really? So because you were not academically bright enough to do anything else. And if you were, it's because somebody somebody took you under their wing and made you their pet project. And you yeah, managed to be dragged through the... And look what we can do if we put all this effort into these poor people. Yeah. You know, and so the thing is, is that's 100 years until 1969 that piece of legislation changed. That's not that long ago. No, it's not. And so that's generation after generation after generation. And we can't expect, I presume we're saying, we can't expect Māori after decades, generations of being treated that way to suddenly pull their socks up and get it all together. Well, and the thing is, why do they need to pull their socks up? Why is well, that's it the implication though, isn't it? Well, well, see, for me, I don't see that implication. My implication is our government needs to pull their yeah. socks up. Our teachers need to pull their socks up. Our, um, our, our local councils need to pull their socks up because actually we know how to be Pākehā. We've done it for hundreds of yes. years now. We know how to assimilate into your culture. What we don't have in this country is understanding of Māori. Right culture. Right. And if we could do that, then we would be truly ambicultural. Thanks for that. We're going to talk more about Te after the break. Welcome back. The problem you've got is selling this, that Te Reo is a, is a compulsory language. And tell me, that there's a lot of research that says if a child learns two languages as a, as a norm, as a youngster, it actually expands their, their ability to learn other languages, expands their ability to learn anything, doesn't it? That's right. Now, uh, there are three things here. First of all, ambiculturalism. Ambiculturalism is be about being ambidextrous in two cultures, right? Okay. We have a moral obligation in this country to at least know the indigenous culture of this country because what sets us apart in the rest of the world when we go outside of our own country, what do we do? We pick up a little piece of bone or a piece of shell, we'll we hunter. wrap it round our neck and off we go off onto our little backpacking tour around the world and you can spot a Kiwi anywhere because look, They've got this little bit of bone on or a little ponamu or a little bit of something. And we know kiwi, boom. We do haka. We do things that dis, um, mark us distinctly as kiwi. And what is that? It's Māori culture. It's about value added. And when we start looking at that Māori culture adds value to our country rather than um, cast us as a deficit, then we will start to accept more and more the integration of kaupapa Māori practice in our country. So that's one thing, truly ambicultural. Second is language, as you said, it opens up the mind when we can um, open our minds to new languages at a very young level. We've learnt this through Kōhangareo. In fact, Kōhangareo has been um, the beacon to the rest of the indigenous cultures around the world about how we transform lives of people through language and learn our language from birth. So we have these windows of opportunities in our brains. And if we can um, introduce language at that level, introduce two languages, introduce three languages. Exactly, why not? Why not? It opens up the mind to so many other things. And why not Māori? I mean, the people go, oh, but you can't speak it anywhere else in the world. I said, so what? You can't speak Welsh anywhere except for Wales. Wales or you don't Gaelic. speak French. Well, actually, that's not true. But Gaelic, yep. all sorts yep. of other but things. But French is, is reasonably limited. Well, There's okay, what about Swedish? Swedish. 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 <laughs> you don't speak that anywhere else in the world. Yeah. German. What about that? German. So do we tell Germans not to bother speaking your own language, please? Can you all just speak English? English. Japanese. It's ridiculous. Japanese, Chinese. Mandarin. Yeah. You know, and so I think for the... It's a specious argument, actually, isn't it? Of course. Yeah. For the greater good of this country, 
why not te reo Māori? Because then it opens our minds and opens ourselves to truly ambicultural nature, to um, a united country where we stop battling against each other and really just embrace it. Yeah. Embrace it. Well, have different. we got? There are increasing number of children choosing to learn te reo. Yes, but our problem, our problem is, is that in our in our schools, it's not scaffolded. Now there is a whole document that shows them what the stages are. There are online resources. There are Māori TV. There are um, books, unit plans, all sorts of resources for teachers. Now I'm a teacher. I know I'm a good teacher. I can teach pretty much any subject you give me. I'll have to go and read up about it first if it's something that plan. I don't know. Make a plan, work it out, find the resources and come back in and teach it. We facilitate education. You don't have to be the expert. Our teachers have said, oh, but I don't want to teach it because I don't feel confident about it. Well, look here. I taught year 11 maths, had never taught maths at that, at that age before. Um, the kids all told me, where the cabbage cast miss? I said, wait on. <laughs> Do you do achievement standards? They look at me and go, yes, we do, and go, well, that's far from cabbage, mate. Let's get down to it, shall we? And it's the way we teach them, and we learn together. Every single one of those students in that class that year who were in the bottom class of the school all passed with 24 credits NCA Level 1 um, achievement standards. Proud of themselves? Proud of themselves. Good. I mean, I taught science to kids who had never passed a science, um, a science test in their lives. They were dyslexic. They passed achievement standards and they were just over the moon. One of them passed one of their standards with excellence. Dyslexic, never never passed a science test in the world. We can teach Te Reo Māori I was gonna say, if but we can put you, our mind to it. Can you, can, but you'd, it seems to me, tell me if I'm wrong, but you'd have to be able to speak Te Reo to teach it. I think you have to be willing to teach it and right. that's where we fall down. Yeah. I don't think you have to be able to speak it. We can, why can't learn we learn together? it with the kids? You do like you need to have some confidence about it. We need to start training it into our teachers' training colleges yeah. more. But there are resources online with sound bites. Yeah, sure. With um, because whole I, the worst thing you could possibly do, especially for some of the um, the older, especially academic Maori, would be to start teaching it badly because a lot of them have real issues with pronunciation. And, yes, and that. I can see that being a little bit of a um, an issue. Yes, but if, if you've been taught something badly, you can fix that. If you've never been taught it at all, you you've got nowhere yet. to start from, yeah, sure, yeah. right? Um, and I think there are a whole lot of people whose deal doesn't really start to flourish until they get into secondary, until they get into tertiary. Um, and so at least there is a base to start from. I teach Te Reo Māori, well, I used to teach Te Reo Māori at in, um, secondary school. I'd get kids who've done quite a good program in their, in their schooling. They'd come and say, Miss, yes, I can do my pepeha, I can count to this, I can um, sing colours. these songs, I know my <laughs> colours, da 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 da. That's all level one. Yeah, it's conversation is what we need, isn't it? Well, the NCA level one is tested at level six of the curriculum. I've got to move those kids at year nine in two years through five different levels, levels of the curriculum yeah. to get them where they need Which, to go. Which, if we'd started at the beginning, Hello. we wouldn't have that. And all I'm talking about is slow scaffolding, building greater and greater depth of language. We're not going to get to a whole bunch of subjects that we wanted to talk about. I suppose what we're saying is that if Māori truly felt that their culture and language were all on a level with Pākehā, that that would bring confidence is that what we're saying and and pride and all those things that everybody's saying absolutely. we're lacking absolutely look at these kids who come out of kura kaupapa maori and farikura they are thriving we've been in survival mode as maori for such a long time we need to turn that to thrival mode right that's my word yeah. i'm sticking with it it's the base of everything absolutely because once you once you're confident in yourself you go off into the world and you go yes i can do this mm. I believe in myself. It's actually, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's the worst world really because the Pākehā culture that came over with, with my forebears was never blow your own trumpet, keep quiet. So you've, you've actually probably got a combination of those things with Māori. You, you, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Not only have you not been able to practice your culture, but you've also been told Every to be quiet. Every time you stand up, they knock you down <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. as a tall puppy syndrome. Yeah, you yeah, win so, both ways. Yeah, yeah, whichever, yeah. Side, whichever side your family's on, you can't really win. Mm. Because I noticed that a lot about the kids is that they just don't seem to have the confidence. And that's actually, that's not limited to Māori. 
boy, teenage boys, a lot of them mm. don't seem mm. to have the confidence. Mm. I think you know, my son is a perfect example. He could, he loved singing. He loved it. He was tone deaf and completely flat. <laughs> he couldn't sing to save himself, but he loved it. His face lightened up. He ran around the house singing. He got the rhythm before he actually got the tune. Yeah. So we just said, man, you're awesome. You're a great singer. He just carried on singing. Mm. Happy he as. Happy as. He writes music now. He sings music now. He writes songs and he's a brilliant singer. So there's a message for parents in here, isn't there? Of course there is. Yeah. But the thing is, is I'm happy to get rid of the Māori seats in this country. We will not need them if we can address the disparities for Māori. When we no longer have disparities in this country for Māori, we can get rid of the Māori seats. The way we address disparities is we build confidence, at least in the Māori kids, at least in the Māori kids. And understanding, understanding in, in the balance of the population. History, all of that sort of stuff. Mm. Balance of the population, and then we're there. Okay. How many years are you going to take to do this? Um, I've got a 36-year plan. 36-year plan. All right, well, good luck with it. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. That's Chat Room tonight. We'll see you next time. <laughs>